Good morning, church. Uh, it's good to see you as we gather together today. I, you'll see me looking occasionally to my right. I believe on screen that's your left. Either way, as we gather together today, I want to greet you from the tech booths of Bellevue United Methodist Church. Uh, each and every week when we gather for worship, uh, we're gathering in many ways, both online and even as we move towards in person, because of the gifts and graces of those who are working oftentimes on the other side of a camera. Um, Jonathan Tyree is one of the key people, but also Liz Sweat and uh, Mike uh, Tristan have been back here making sure week in and week out as we've moved to hybrid that this happens. And so today I'm the one greeting you from the tech booth because, well, much of our parking lot is still a block of ice. And so we are thankful for the sun that's out today uh, that will be hopefully melting some of that away and making it much safer for folks to get out and move around and much warmer uh, for those who find themselves outside, whether for work or the lack of shelter. Uh, as we gather today and prepare for worship, I did want to take a second to remind you that if you didn't get already, you should have received a Lenten devotional uh, in the mail. Uh, we sent them last week with the intention that they would be there by Ash Wednesday, and then a, s a winter storm hit and mail service stopped for almost all of last week. Maybe for some of you, it's still in progress. Um, so please let us know this week, if you haven't received your devotional guide and the little burlap cross that came with it, we want to know so we can get that to you. Um, so you can send an email to the church office at bumc.com. Uh, you can give us a call over at the church office. Uh, we will be open this week. Let us know because we want this resource to be in your hands. Uh, Lent is the perfect time uh, to, to start new practices. Um, the six weeks of Lent allows us some space and some time to really uh, kind of reconnect to both God and the community of faith. And so as we gather together today, I greet you in the name of the Lord, and I invite you to take in a deep breath. <sighs> Maybe if you're sitting near a window, look out and give thanks for the gift of sunlight. And if you're joining us from afar where it's still cloudy or rainy or wet or snowy, um, we're grateful for the gift of technology that allows us to worship uh, not just here in Nashville, Tennessee, but around the world. So in the, in the spirit of that celebration, as we gather together in the name of Christ, let us worship to God today with joyful hearts. Thanks be to God.
join me in the call to worship. Your response is, be with us, God. God, there's a lot of water out there. There's water that you call us from, nurtured us in, fed us through, wrapped us up in, and baptismal waters that release us to newness and to life. Be with us, God. We wait on you, God, who controls the water. We wait. We wait for the rivers to become calm again. We wait for the streams of peace to drench our feet as we go forward, knowing our steps are ordered by you. Be with us, God. God, the water is wide, but your grace to handle it is so much wider. Be with us, God, in the water. Be with us, we pray, as we gather to worship you. Be with us, God. chapter 1 verses 9 through 15. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to get into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at, in, is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to praise be to you, O Christ. Good morning, everyone. I want to talk to you today about the church season we're in called Lent. Did anyone participate in the Ash Wednesday service we just had this past week? Ash Wednesday was the first day in the season of Lent. Now that's Lent with an E, not Lent with an I. Lent with an I is the, the stuff you find in your pocket. Lent with an E comes from the word long. It's the season of the church year that leads up to Easter, which is when we celebrate Jesus being raised from the dead. Lent is the 40 days before Easter, not including Sundays. Lent is a special season of prayer and thinking when we can take a look at our own lives and be sure that we're doing what God wants us to do and becoming the people that God wants us to be. So to help you remember what Lent is, I want you to imagine that we're going to a park or a playground. So close your eyes and imagine walking down the, the street. We're getting to where the playground is and we can see everyone playing. It looks like they're having a lot of fun. But from where we are and where the playground is, there's a road. Now, can we just run across that road and go play? No, no, that's right. We need to stop. 
then what? Well, then we need to look. We need to look both ways to see if a car is coming. Then what? That's right, we need to listen. We need to listen to what's around us to make sure that it's safe to cross the street. So let's stop, let's look both ways, and let's listen to see if we hear anything coming. Is it safe to cross the street? It is, let's go. And so we cross the street together and go to the playground to play. You can open your eyes now. We know that when we walk around in the world, when we go to places in our neighborhood or in our community, we have to stop, we have to look, and we have to listen so that we're staying safe. And it's important to stop, look, and listen on our journey as Christians too. We get so busy that we're often in a rush and it's important that we take time to stop, we take time to look around and we think about what we're doing are we doing what God wants us to do? Are we becoming the sort of person that God wants us to become? And we need to listen to God by praying and by reading the Bible and spending time thinking and talking with God about what God envisions for our lives. The season of Lent is a perfect time to do that. When we take time to stop look and listen, we can make sure that our lives are lined up with the way God wants us to live them so that we can be on the right track to enjoy all the wonderful adventures that God has in store for us. Let's pray. Dear God, help us always to remember to stop, look, and listen when we cross the street and on our Christian walk with you. Amen. As we gather on this first Sunday of Lent, I want to take a moment uh, to share just a few words about the Gospel of Mark before we dive into today's story. Uh, these words are found in the uh, CEB Women's Bible, uh, in, the, in the intro to the Gospel of Mark, and, and I find them to be really helpful. It's a great summary and invitation as we're thinking about this Gospel today and the story we'll hear. These are the words. The Gospel of Mark offers an urgent and sometimes unsettling account of Jesus and his mission, which signals the dawn of God's kingdom. Mark was likely written around 70 AD in a time that the community wrestled with hard questions about what it meant to follow a crucified and risen Lord. 
I want to say that second one again um, because it, it's really helpful. Likely was written in a time that the community wrestled with hard questions about what it meant to follow a crucified and risen Lord. In light of that, uh, those two statements, I'd like to invite us into uh, today's story of the baptism of Jesus. In these six verses that we're going to venture into today, G Mark says a lot about Jesus and really invites us into a journey with Jesus. I, I think you'll be amazed at how much Mark packs into such few verses, such a small story. It can be easy to overlook uh, some kind of telling elements about this story. For instance, the story starts out this way in verse 9. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized, baptized him in the Jordan River. Sounds like a pretty standard statement. Jesus is from Nazareth of Galilee. He came to the River Jordan. He was baptized by John. But to understand some of the between the lines, the behind the scenes, we have to acknowledge that that there's very little said about Nazareth. In fact, if you were to search throughout the gospel and explore where you might find Nazareth pop up, one of the stories that might likely stand out to you is actually found in John chapter 1, where after uh, Philip has encountered Jesus and has uh, begun to follow him, he goes and he connects with Nathaniel and says, the one we've been waiting on has come, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel's response is, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's such a small community. There are some archaeologists that, that believe it could have been so small that it was roughly 60 acres and less than 500 people. And in fact, Galilee uh, was on the, uh, that kind of opposite side of the tracks or opposite side of the river uh, from Judea. Judea is where they would have pointed to say, oh, well, the faithful, the faithful live there whereas Galilee was kind of the other side of the tracks. You know the phrase, possibly. You know, that, that side of town that's poor and that's on the margins that nobody thinks anything good can come from. So essentially, Mark's introduction to Jesus is at about the time John is preaching in the River Jordan and inviting people from all over Judea to change their hearts and lives, along comes Jesus from Nowheresville to be baptized by John. So somebody who has literally no note uh, of notoriety, the nobody, comes onto the scene. But God has a way of doing something with the nobodies in our world, amen? And so this nobody is going to shake things up. And in fact, when he comes to the River Jordan, uh, immediately we are found we find ourselves hearing almost a part of the story that that we were, weren't really going to be able to experience but we're given an insight it's kind of the beauty of of reading right in theater we call it the fourth wall where the character kind of steps to the front of the stage and gives us an insight we didn't know uh, in our story today it says jesus looked up and he sees the heavens split open and a dove descend upon him and a and the voice of God says, you are my son whom I love. With you I find happiness. At least that's how the common English Bible uh, states it in the New Revised Standard. Uh, you are my son, the beloved, and you I, uh, in, in you I am greatly pleased, or in you I am pleased. Jesus' identity is claimed in that moment of baptism. This is God's son. Now, throughout the story, ironically, if you keep reading in Mark, it seems that Jesus doesn't want everybody to know that. Every time he comes to a, a healing early on of someone who's been possessed by a demon, he tells them they have to be silent. Uh, the centurion at the end of the Gospel of Mark would say, this was God's son. There's moments where that would emerge throughout the story, but, but for Mark, this is a telling moment. Because that identity that Jesus hears, that Jesus experiences, that we as readers and those who are hearing the story, even as Mark is sharing it, need to know that. But not just need to know it so that we can say, great, Jesus, Son of God, but so that we can know it, that that really means something. 
that that's going to change the way we come to experience the world. That things are, are different. And in fact, one of the gifts that we have every time we baptize someone is the words that lead us into baptism. We say through the sacrament of baptism, you are initiated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. That's what we say of every child, youth, and adult who's baptized in the United Methodist Church. They are entering into God's mighty acts of salvation. You become a part of this story of God that's been before you and will be after you. And yet, in that moment, we are claiming you are God's child. You are God's child. You are God's beloved with whom God finds great joy, great happiness. That's hard for us sometimes to hear. And, and I think part of the reason it's so hard for us to hear is really found in the next part of the story for Jesus as well. It says right after he's baptized that he's pressed into the wilderness where he's tempted. Now, Mark does not give us the details of that temptation. We'd have to go to the Gospel of Matthew to read what that temptation really looked like. Uh, but one of the pieces that you can imagine would be first tempted is to deny the very identity that he just heard in the baptism. To deny that he's the Son of God. To deny that God finds joy and, and happiness and rejoices in Jesus. I think oftentimes we struggle with temptation as well. And I'm not just simply talking about the temptation to eat too much or to engage in addictive behaviors or to do harm. All of those are symptomatic in many ways of a, of a depth of brokenness that sin brings into our life. And so oftentimes I wonder if, if as we learned on Ash Wednesday, we already have a smear or a smudge upon our heart all the time. The liturgy that we used on Ash Wednesday this year was written by Reverend uh, M. Barclay. Uh, M. Barclay's website, enfleshed.com, uh, shares with us these words, and I, I want to share them again today because I think they're so powerful. Barclay says, There is nothing divine that is born from believing you are awful. I'm going to say it again because I need to hear it and maybe you do too. There is nothing divine that is born from believing you are awful. So one of the first things we have to recognize is the temptation to deny the very identity of God's beloved child that we're given in baptism. Oftentimes we, we could hear the shouting, the screaming of the world that says we're not enough, we don't make enough, we don't have the right status. We don't wear the right clothes, live in the right house, drive the right car. The list could go on. And I imagine if we were to take enough time and ask everybody to write it, we could fill, fill a chalkboard or a box with all the paper we would write with the ways in which people tell us we're not enough. And so what do we do in the midst of that? Well, in our baptism, one of the things that I most love about our baptismal liturgy are the questions we ask. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and justice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you accept, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And in union with the church which he has opened to people of all ages and nations, will you serve? Will you uh, will you lean into that? Will you become a person of faith uh, who is transformed by that very grace? That, those questions are nudging us or saying, are you willing to renounce, reject, repent? To, do you receive the, the freedom and power God gives you? Do you accept it that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to all people? Each of these questions, I believe, uh, help us look at the ways in which we resist, which we resist temptation. They give us a way out in a sense that we're going to claim more the identity we have in Christ than the identity the world seems to want to give us. 
Now, I will tell you, that's hard work. It doesn't come easily. Um, even in the midst of that work, I'm mindful that Mark probably gives us the most human encounter with Jesus. That's why I love the intro that the Women's Study Bible shares about Mark, that sometimes it's an unsettling account of Jesus and his mission. He's a little on edge at times. You can see his anger. You can see uh, when he becomes frustrated that people are not getting it. He calls out not just foes, but also friends. And so today, I, I, I want to share that I'm, I'm deeply grieved as we enter this Lenten season by the polarization that seems to continue to thrive in our society. But it's not just in our larger society, it's thriving in our community, in our neighborhood, in our families, and even in our church. Thrive's probably not the right word. What I would probably be more honest in saying is that I feel like the polarizing nature in which we're finding ourselves isn't just the fault of, quote, Republicans and Democrats. But it's the root of the brokenness of sin in our life where we allow that which separates us to reign supreme. And it grieves my heart because in many ways we're giving in to the disaster that will come with it. It will destroy us. It will destroy us individually, our families, our communities, our congregations, our nation, and our world. So what do we do in the midst of it? Well, one of the things that Jesus did after his season in the wilderness was he returns uh, in verse 14. It says, after John was arrested. After John was arrested, do you know why he was arrested? For calling out the way things were and saying it wasn't right. John was arrested for calling out Herod, the leader, the powers that would be he was arrested for calling into question the status quo. And ultimately, he wouldn't just be arrested, but would be beheaded. It's that moment that nudges Jesus to begin proclaiming these very things and that we see in verse 15. Now is the time, here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. That moment of of seeing John be arrested and ultimately beheaded would nudge Jesus' ministry to launch in a different way. It's time to say, the kingdom of God is near. It's at hand. Change your heart and lives. Lent is a perfect time for us to allow our hearts and minds to be recaptured, to be reclaimed by our baptism, to lean into our faith in Christ in a way that it says maybe it's time for us to call into question the way things were, the way things are. We're in this in-between space as we live in this pandemic, and on the other side of it, we'll still be in an in-between. What was before March 2020 isn't coming back. I'm sorry. I grieve to say that. It hurts me to have to live in that tension as well. So why not allow this in-between season uh, to be a time of transition where our hearts and lives are changed, where we're more aware of the brokenness of the world around us, or we're unwilling to, uh, to sit back quietly to the inequality in housing and education and health care, uh, that we are not willing to sit silently when racial injustice perpetuates itself, that we want to see the beloved community of God lived out in real time in our day not just in some future time. And so we, we resist. We resist. We accept the freedom and power God gives us to resist evil and justice and oppression. We accept Jesus as Lord, as Savior, excuse me. We accept Jesus as Savior and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church. We proclaim the good news. And good news should be good news to all. It should liberate, not oppress. It should free us. Free us for joyful obedience. To get there, we do have to start with some words of repentance. With some acknowledgement that maybe we've been listening too much to the screaming of the world. 
And so before we can fully trust the good news, we got to spend some time learning that good news. And that good news when Jesus stood up in his hometown synagogue, well, it didn't make them thrilled at times. Some even rejected him. In fact, a few took him out to the ledge to try and throw him off a cliff. So the good news will get you in trouble. Because when we're proclaiming good news, it has to be good news to the poor, to the oppressed, to the marginalized, to those who are blind, to those who need to be set free. So this Lent, let's take on those practices that help us reclaim our baptismal identity. We are God's children, God's beloved. But then we can't just sit in that moment and go, isn't that good news? No, it's good news when it's being lived out. When it's not just something for me, but I'm seeing and desiring it for the world around me. Not pressing upon what I think it'll be, but allowing God to work and, and work in and through me. And sometimes even give me the, the eyes to see what I've been blind to. The ears to hear what I've been deaf to. And the heart that's been too hard to receive. God's doing something in our world. Even in the midst of this season of physical distancing, God is doing something to transform us. On Ash Wednesday of this last week, when we gathered for worship, I saw a glimpse of that. And the beautiful sharing that happened by those who gathered for worship, when they named what they were thankful for, when they acknowledged that there was work to be done, when they heard the words, you are not awful. You were created for good. You were created good. So take a deep breath as we enter this Lenten season. And allow God's Spirit to meet you and help you find that one practice that might help you reclaim who you are in God's grace and love. And that, that might even guide you in the midst of all the chaos and noise and the temptation to let it go. This season is one where we can go more deeply. So let's hear the invitation that Rachel offered our children. Maybe it's time to stop, to look, and to listen. Grant us grace in the midst of that work, God. Amen. <laughs> As we gather together for our time of prayer and worship, I thought it was probably appropriate to do it outdoors, um, in the midst of the snow, but also hearing the birds chirping and whatnot behind us, my neighbors moving, cars starting to get out of the development. Um, the season is going to change. Spring is going to come. But in the midst of all this snow, we want to remember those whose lives have been lost because of the weather in our own community and state and especially those in Texas who are suffering from the cold and lack of electricity and of access to water. This storm has caused quite a bit of pain, and we pray with all of those this day who especially need to feel God's presence near. I want to remind you to pray with those who are on your own prayer list as well as those in our newsletter. And let us now go to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Holy One, how you love us, God of rainbow promises. Like a mother who teaches her son the steps for his first dance, like the father who goes out with his daughter after work so she can learn how to drive, you love us that much and so much more. How you offer yourself to us, brother of the beloved, 
You gather us up in your arms simply to hear our deepest hopes. You reach out your scarred hands to gently wipe our fears away. You stain a cross with your blood so we might be washed clean in the tears pouring down God's face. How you share yourself with us, journey spirit. You bathe our wearied souls in the cooling waters of baptism. You wipe the dust of the wilderness out of our eyes so we can see the kingdom. You teach us those ancient ways which offer new life for each one of us. God in community, holy in one, be with us in this Lenten season, even as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to offer before God our lives and God's tithes, I invite you to hear these words from Tom Schumann in his book, uh, Where the Broken Gather. Reverend Schumann says these words, God takes our broken promises and turns them into vows of faithfulness. God takes our biggest failings and shapes lives of service. God listens to our prayers of confession and changes them into songs of mercy. Let us come to the one who pours forgiveness into our lives. So today, as you consider the ways in which you uh, might have your heart and your life transformed by God's grace and mercy, uh, I want to invite you uh, to, to take on a practice that would truly move you closer to God. One of those practices that is celebrated each and every Sunday at this moment is the, the practice of generosity, of giving. It's a way of saying, what I have, God, is really not mine to own, but mine to care for. I'm a caretaker of all that I have, a manager, a steward, not an owner. That does not mean that we don't have some choice to make. We do. Um, and so part of our practice of giving week in and week out when we uh, pause for this time of offering is for us to acknowledge God's goodness and grace and to say, I want to be a part of that work through my life, through my actions, through my time and energy, but also through the resources that have been given to me and trusted to me. And so I invite you to give with a joyful heart as we uh, continue our work in ministry together. You can give financially uh, to support the church and the work of ministry through our website, through text message, uh, or through a good old mail, mail-in check. All of those ways are ways we can be a part of it. But it truly is an opportunity for us to practice what we believe uh, in that we are truly caretakers of all that we have. And so today, as we uh, prepare for our time of giving, as we reflect upon that, I invite you to be blessed by the music of, of Jonathan, <clears throat> excuse me, of Jonathan and Gavin, as they offer to us an offertory in a different way today. So receive this with joy as you give with a joyful heart.
follow me in prayer. Righteous God, we mark these early days in the Lenten journey with reminders of Christ's time in the wilderness and your loving care for him there. As we prepare to offer our gifts to you, we are reminded that you love us deeply. May gratitude for this love move us to offer not only money, but our whole being. In Christ we pray. Amen. As we prepare to go forth today uh, as followers of Jesus, as disciples, I want to invite you to hear this prayer. It's the one we pray right after we baptize a child, a youth, or an adult. And may you receive it as a part of our benediction today. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born by water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. What would happen if you prayed that every day? When you washed your face, when you took a shower, when you brushed your teeth, when you took a drink of water. Holy Spirit, work within me. That by water and the Spirit, I might be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Find a way to become more mindful in the coming days, in this season of Lent, of the, of the beautiful claim that you are my beloved, you are my child, that God is speaking to us. And may our baptism and our living a life of faith in Christ begin to transform the way in which we see the world, that we see the injustice and oppression, but that we work to resist it, that we work to see our community and our world transformed. Let's have the audacity to believe that we can make a difference, that we can be a reflection of God's grace and mercy, and that we can see that in another. May you go now in the grace of God, as you love God and neighbor. Amen. We